Hi everyone, I'm Gabrielle Laura Seller from the Museum at FIT. Welcome to the Virtual Artist Talk series. This is a collaborative series between the Museum at FIT and the Art and Design Gallery. Joining me today are my co-collaborators, Austin Thomas and Losan Sewan. Today, we are happy to have with us FIT political science professor, Praveen Chowdhury and Susina Mushtaq, assistant visiting professor of communications and media studies at the University of Wisconsin. Today, the pair will present their photo documentary series, New York City, Pandemic, Resilience and Hope. Together, their images document life in New York City over the past year in a strikingly and compelling way. Uh, the, pre the presentation will be followed by some Q&A, and then to wrap things up, FIT photography student Massimo Avanzato will present a walkthrough of the virtual exhibition he curated, which highlights some of the images taken by Praveen and Susina. So for now, please keep yourselves muted, post your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll visit them following the presentation. And so welcome, Susina and Praveen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, Austin, and Lobsang for all your planning and organizing this event and virtual exhibition. It was not an easy job, and we appreciate all your hard work and commitment to this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. In March 2020, New York City came to a creaking halt. As the COVID-19 pandemic brought about restrictions, all of us were caged in our homes. Streets were deserted, subways empty. Times Square looked haunted. Ambulance sirens pierced the silently grieving city. With the murder of George Floyd, protesters filled the once empty city, now roaring with the cries of Black Lives Matter. By the end of the election results, the city was celebrating the promise of hope. All of this in less than a year. Although based in New York City, our photographs reflect global emotions. Someday, hopefully, we will look back and ponder on how we got through this trauma and pain. How we moved on as 2020 makes its way in our history books and becomes a distant past. Before we delve further into the talk, I want to give you all some background about our work and how we got involved in this project. For the last several years, our focus has been on nomads and beavers of Tibet, Kashmir, and Uruks of Taurus Mountains in Anatolia in Turkey. The work is more like a virtual ethnography which means focusing on a group of people and their lives by living with them in different seasons while documenting their lives. A last exhibition focused on Europe's of Turkey and was displayed on the walls of Gladys Marcus Library at FIT. Because of the pandemic, these pictures are still hanging in the library. If you have recently visited the FIT campus, on the glass facing the 28th street in the main sea lobby, you'll find a massive image of a woman, her back towards the camera as she walks her goats. That's our work. These images were supposed to be shipped to the main gallery at the International Technical University in Istanbul for an exhibition scheduled in the summer of 2020. Of course it didn't happen and no points for guesses. Some of you may have also seen our past work displayed in sea lobby of FIT, focusing on nomads and beavers of Tibet and Kashmir. When the lockdown was announced in mid-March last year, and still cannot believe it's been a year, our lives came to a halt. There was no traveling. Conferences were canceled. Our exhibition was postponed indefinitely. Although as New Yorkers, we always take pictures of the city, pictures in the city, 
We never thought that our city would become our subject during the pandemic. How do you document a pandemic? State violence, killing of innocent black people, curfews, elections, anger, frustrations, and of course, hope, all in a span of just 10 months. I believe even history would fail to provide us any similar examples of anything close to what we witnessed in 2020, just in 10 months. For all of us, particularly New Yorkers, it was too much to handle. New York City depends heavily on tourism. 66 million people visited the city in 2019. $46 billion were spent annually just in the hospitality industry of our city. In 2020, between March 1 and May 1, during the first wave of the COVID-19, about 420,000 people left the city. People who fled were mainly divided along the race and class lines. In wealthy neighborhoods, the population dropped by 40%. Many parts of the early 2020 were layered in uncertainty and silence without knowing what the next day would bring. We live very close to a major medical center. So of course our days and nights were filled with ambulance sirens and the 7 p.m. rituals of banging pots and pans supporting the city's essential and health workers. We watched all of this, sometimes in silence, sometimes in awe. Sometimes there was nothing but frustration and other times there was only hope. So we picked our phones and cameras whenever we could and captured the moment as it was for our eyes and of course for the Instagram followers. We never thought that pictures taken during this pandemic would amount to thousands of pictures which would ultimately birth this project. New York City, pandemic, resilience and hope. Something else happened that played an essential role in the birth of this project. For New Year's Eve in 2019, we landed in the beautiful city of Beirut in Lebanon from London. Being terribly jet lagged and dehydrated, I had a terrible fall on the steps of an old hotel made of marble stones. Although there was no fracture, my leg, hip, and ankle were badly hurt. Back home in New York City, my doctors recommended long-term physical therapy. And of course, by then, the pandemic had hit hard. A couple of weeks into the pandemic, my physical therapist, an accomplished writer himself, called to let me know that the clinic was open with limited capacity that I could come for my therapy if I wanted to. I said yes to those office visits. Instead of taking cabs or Uber, my mode of transportation remained in the subway, either the A or D train to Midtown, where his office was. My first memory of walking in Midtown during the early days of the pandemic is empty streets empty Times Square. I remember taking a picture of Erie Times Square where I was the only person. And I captioned the picture, what is Times Square without people? Bunch of LED screens. Over to you, Praveen. For the first time in my memory, 24 hours subway service was halted so that the trains and the stations could be disinfected. How is our work different from most of the artists of this period? We were not on a daily eight miles running regiment, nor do we move in our car. Maybe because we were so used to collecting human faces in our work 
that we were craving for that closeness to collect emotions in a pandemic when most of us are locked inside our apartments. Throughout the pandemic, we kept taking public transport. In the beginning, we did not have any mask. No one had mask. It was a rare commodity. There's a drugstore in my building. And the manager told me, you're waitlisted for the mask. A kind soul from far away place shared a video explaining how to make a paper towel, a uh, mask from paper towel. And that's what we did. I do have a picture I shared with Massimo. Maybe he can show us that later. Many weeks later, our friend from Boston mailed us our first back pack of surgical mask, followed by colleagues in our department who made cloth mask. For our pictures, we mostly stayed in Manhattan, between Inwood and Union Square, and sometimes to the Staten Island Ferry. We did take a few trips to Queens. We traveled both on the east and west side. A and one train were our regular mode of transportation. And from time to time, we also took the D and E train and the Staten Island Ferry. Most of the pictures of empty cars and stations are within these boundaries of our travels. We constantly posted images from these places. We did get messages from concerned friends that we are taking a grave risk. We noticed a pattern started emerging from these images. We also noticed a straightforward income inequality story. We were not aware that other people are also seeing these patterns in our images that we were posting on social media. The first pattern that we noticed was the train cars, like the eight train and the C train originating from Manhattan, or the one train going towards South Ferry was abandoned. You saw those in pictures. Even the past Tuesday, just two days back, the one train during evening rush hour looked totally abandoned. I had posted a picture. Although the latest data shows some positive signal, the subway ridership has crept back to about a third of its usual level. For some neighborhood, ridership has bounced back to almost 50% of their peak pandemic ridership. It's worth mentioning here that the neighborhoods like Queens and the Bronx are the home to many of the city's essential work, primarily minorities. During the peak of the pandemic, while the A train looked abandoned, you could see people in D and E train. And if you look at them carefully, you will notice they were part of the essential service workforce. For nearly the entire chunk of 2020, the mainstream thinking was gearing towards political polarization and science rejection. More than half a million people died in the United States in the process. Just in New York City, by April 2020, 27,400 people died. We are getting emotionally drained. 10 months felt like 10 years. We did notice the backlash towards the Asian community at every phase of these 10 months, compounded mainly by the racial slurs spitted out by the guy in the White House. And this is really emotional for me. Let me read you an example, an email from a student on March 14, 2020. She may be listening to this, and there is no way I'll identify her. This was also a week when I was warned by, uh, when I had warned my students, some of you may be here, and that, that this might be our last face-to-face -face meeting. So here is the text of the email I received from my student on that day, March 2020. Dear Professor Chowdhury, sorry to bother you on the weekend. Yesterday, some stranger said terrible things to me on the street and followed down a whole block maybe because of my ethnicity. My family is concerned about my safety and health and suggested that I should go back home. 
your class is one of the best classes I have ever taken at FIT. I'll give you my best to all the assignments as usual. But since I'll be in a different time zone, I want to make sure I don't miss any classes. I'm dreadfully sorry for the inconvenience, but please help me with this situation. Thank you so much. Regards. I wrote back, so sorry to hear this. When are you leaving? Do you want to meet on Monday in my office? She said, yes, and came to see me on Monday. I was so heartbroken to hear that she was talking and taking a flight in a few hours. What bothers me most is that this amazingly bright and intelligent student will never forget that on March 16, 2020, she had to leave New York City, not because of the pandemic, pandemic but because of racism. Um, I sometimes just a single line um, from a song can say everything. So I have a line for her, which I really want Sozina to say, because if I say, I'll just choke. So please, Sozina, help me here. Yeah, to borrow words from Billie Eilish, if they knew what they said would go straight to my head, what would they say instead? Welcome to America. After the murder of George Floyd, the city streets were flooded with people rallying with the demand for rights for African-American community. They reminded us, no justice, no peace. We marched with protesters who claimed the deserted streets, shouted Black Lives Matter while documenting the history. Then came the elections. And after days of uncertainty, when people finally chose a new president of this country, it felt like a new day. It was a breath of fresh air after months of feeling suffocated. Suddenly people poured on the streets again, but this time there was joy, celebration. And we rushed to the same place where this project started, Times Square. And this time, the empty streets were taken over by the joyous people. Praveen. Uh, can you You're muted. Praveen, thank you. On purpose, I had shut down my camera. I didn't want anyone to uh, see me getting emotional. Uh, so there was a sense of relief, uh, respite, uh, despite the pandemic. Despite everything, for me, all this joy reflected in a single image of a Muslim couple that day on Times Square. I was too emotional to approach them and take their picture. But Suzina had also seen them. She was brave enough to approach them and ask them for a picture. The couple happily obliged. Uh, and we are going to share this picture with all of you. That night in Times Square, with all joyous faces around us, gave us a glimpse of the resilience of our city. With James Baldwin, whom I rega regard as one of New York City's best observers, calls the city which the people from heaven had made their home. Uh, so <clears throat> at this point, we are done with our talk, but I'll add two more things. <clears throat> There's a long quote from James Baldwin, and we didn't want it to read that. Uh, and that quote, if you go in our virtual exhibition, right on the left side of the steps, you will see that quote. And everything Baldwin writes, if you read that quote and then walk to 59th Street Columbus Circle, you can feel the energy. You can feel everything he says in that quote. And my friend, a historian friend, Dan Wilk, I'm sure he, I never told him about this quote, or I never actually uh, uh, talked to him about this quote. Uh, uh, one time he told me, you know, there's one train station which I don't like, and that is 59th Street, because people are just so unpredictable when you're coming in and out uh, uh, of the cars. So it was kind of interesting that what my historian friend was talking about and what James Baldwin kind of talked about uh, uh, many decades back uh, was so true even uh, today. Uh, 
so with that uh, anything else uh, Susina you want to add or uh, I, no, can I think move. we'll be talking about some individual pictures now yeah so now, if you want to take from with there. this I want to uh, show you two pic a few pictures and I'm sure Susina will also show you two pictures so can you uh, move to slide number two So slide number two, I was, we were walking near that physical therapist, uh, you know, uh, office uh, and I saw this image and for me, it's so powerful. It's like you're gazed, your city is gazed, your country is gazed, your identity is gazed, no matter where you may be living, you know, this flag is not just representing a particular country. It is, it is a representation of the global uh, you know uh, things that, what, that was happening at that time so for me it was it's a very powerful symbol but it's also a very depressing symbol because if I look at this as the picture that what then what am I trying to say and that's where the picture of Times Square again a flag gives you hope gives you that things can change so can I move to uh, slide number 49 This is just magical. That evening, just looking at her, just looking at the kid, just looking at the man, and just looking at that woman in her headscarf with the flag, uh, gave you a sense that change is possible. Uh, so, so you can see the two flags, how actually um, are, you know, pasted side by side with very different feelings. And I'll show you one more picture, which actually reminded me of my mother. Can you go to slide number three, please? Uh, so we were, I think we were in the A train. Um, we used to go to the Inwood Park and sometimes Central Park, so we might be coming back. And from nowhere, this couple came. Uh, it was November. And you can see the two guides, the dad and the son. And you can see the invisible hand. And this is what reminded me of my mother. In the Asian culture, and I'm sure it's true for many other cultures, mothers are invisible. Someone asked me this question, how come I just see a hand? Where is that person? That's the beauty of this image. You don't see that person. The person who is so aggressively protecting and caring and worrying uh, about uh, the family is that invisible hand, is that mom. So now, Susina, your turn. Yeah, can I have images four and five? You can just go back and forth between them. It was an uncertain spring, wrote Virginia Woolf almost 84 years ago. You know, my seven years in the city, I had never seen an empty subway or an empty subway station. Indeed, it was an uncertain spring of March 2020. At the end of the month, I had one of the worst breakdowns of my life. And I think it was inevitable. The news about the pandemic, the escalating deaths, shortage of basic amenities in the hospitals, the irrelevance of common people, all of it. On March 27, 2020, we had around 251 deaths in one day and a record 3.3 million people filed for unemployment. To quote Joe Brennard, sometimes everything seems so, oh, I don't know. Can I have image? 11 and 12, please. Here you see almost empty Whole Foods. And in the next picture, in picture 12, you'll see a long line of people waiting for their turn to get inside the grocery store. I remember reading a news about a family of six people where the mother survived on Dr. Pepper all day 
so that she can only eat one meal at night just to save money. Her husband was a carpenter whose job had slowed down because of the pandemic. Thank goodness for the free lunches provided by school for our kids. The pandemic brought about the inequality in this country up front, and it was heartbreaking to say the least. In the New York Times, Jonathan Mahler wrote, and I quote, New York City used to be a city filled with stories. Today, it's a city with a single story. And I think that sums up our project as well. Thank you, and I will open the talk for the questions now. Thank you both, Praveen and Susina, for a wonderful presentation. I have um, in the chat, I see that Ken Weisinger says, thank you, Praveen and Susina. Wonderful image that for a very dark time. Prince Tim Cunningham, sheer genius and thoughtful grace. And I'd like to say to both of you too, that seeing the images on uh, Instagram kept me connected to New York City. I'm in New Jersey. And so I want to thank you for posting every day and keeping me connected to what was happening in the city. That's such a big part, that was such a big part of my life. I really thank you thank both you. for doing that. Appreciate it. If anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat. I have one. Uh, Daniel Levinson will ask, are these images ethnographic and in a different way than your earlier work? Susina, you want to take it? Um, sure. I think yes, in a way, because earlier we never thought that the city we lived in, would that would become the subject of our project because we would go to different countries, um, in Tibet, in Kashmir, or in, in Turkey, and sort of look for stories there. Um, so in a way, I feel, uh, yes, it was a different project because this was home you know, and we um, really never thought that that would become a part of uh, a subject of our of our project. Um, Praveen, you want to add to that? Yeah, I agree. And and really, the, the big difference is that in our earlier projects, we just focused on uh, a certain uh, community uh, and certain area. And it was in a span of many years, as of some of you know, we have been working on this almost for six, seven years. But this one was just heartbreaking. Everything happened in 10 months. You know, uh, I, I just don't know from where I got this courage to actually talk to you guys. Uh, I just get very emotional. I, and what Gabriel is saying is also so true. Those of you, for some reason, actually, who are not in New York City, just looking at our images, kind of, it reminds you, oh my God, this is the place where I used to go or I used to hang out, you know? Uh, uh, so it hit home. That's what I can uh, say then, that I was, uh, we were not expecting ever to make New York City as our, you know, uh, uh, place for a project for this kind of work. No, never. Thank you. Other comments, um, Molly shown striking photos and insightful talks. Thank you, say, says thank you to both of you. Uh, wonderful work, dear, from, from Italy, Rome, we shared the same horror, now just one word, hope, and that's from Patty. Sadaf Munshi says, these images are, are amazing and powerful pictures and an exceptional, exceptional documentation, thank you. We have Joan Endress saying, such a thoughtful and emotional talk. I think we all have been guarding ourselves from all the emotional aspects of this year this lays us bare, thank you. Okay. I'd like to, Massimo, are you ready to present the walkthrough of the exhibition? Yes. Let me share my screen. Massimo, I'll just remind everyone that Massimo is uh, a photography major. He's also my work study student. And when Austin Lozano and I asked him to 
curate this the virtual exhibition on art steps. He was so excited to do it. So here we have uh, the exhibition. Yeah, so I was asked to curate the exhibition and I've never used art steps before. Um, so it was a little bit of a learning curve, but I think it's a really beautiful way to showcase art with our state of the world right now. Um, so I'm gonna walk us through it. So I started with this image because as Praveen said, it's like hopeful and it's kind of the core theme of the work. It felt like the center point of the series. Um, over here, we have some smaller prints um, and I chose to focus on kind of color images and transportation and street, which is a major theme of the series. We have some black and white prints over here. I chose to put all black and white on one side to kind of tie them together. And I thought that all the black and whites were really beautiful and contrasty. Um, and so I thought that they really worked well together. This is my favorite image from the um, exhibition because I live off of this train, the seven train. And so this was something that I was used to seeing every day going from FIT to my apartment. And I love how the train has this ghostly kind of image to it. And yet the figures that are standing there are just perfectly still. I really thought this image was captivating and beautiful. So now we're back to the front of the exhibition. Um, more smaller prints. I kind of just did a mixture of the street photography and like social justice events that happened this year. We have two black and whites on this side. Um, this image on the left of the chains um, is also another favorite of mine because I think it's very abstract, but it's also suggestive of a lot of elements that pe people felt like chained in certain ways this year and also throughout their whole life, I'm sure. And then we have this really beautiful image from the Black Lives Matter protests. And I love that you can see through the flag, it's transparent. Hold on, sorry. We have this image over here. And then in the back of the exhibition, we have some quotes and a little seating area. <laughs> um, so then if we go up these stairs, there's two rooms. And for this room, I kind of chose to focus on detail shots. And then also, again, like the mixture of street and home um, for these images. And I really liked the color image because it's so vibrant. And so I wanted to frame it with these two kind of more low key um, black and white images. And there's two more black and white images on this side. And here I chose to do um, all color images. And again, it's a mixture of street and transportation, the main themes in the series. And on this side we have two more colors too. I really love this picture of this woman because I feel like her face and body language tells so much. And I like that this image of the boy is kind of, um, similar but different. He's kind of in his own world and she's in her own world, but in different ways. So we have another quote here by James Baldwin on the wall. And we have this image right here that they said was a supermarket line on the wall. And then we can go down the stairs. And then there's this little hidden room back here 
and it's the title of the exhibition. So that's a walkthrough of the exhibition. You can visit at any time. Um, and sometimes it even shows when there's people in the same gallery as you, which is really cool. You see like a ghostly kind of image of other people looking at the artwork. So feel free to go around. You can click the images and they all have different titles and captions. And you can make them bigger. So yeah. Great. Great job. Thank you, Ms. Amoy. It's so beautifully you have you brought magic in these, you know, the way you place these pictures. Thank you. Really great. I just want to circle back to some of the comments for you just before we leave. Um, Marisol De Luna says, lines for food, lines for voting, lines for vaccinations, lines for testing. So many people, and it was mostly silent. Couldn't see faces. How did this make both of you feel in a city so large? So, Zina, you have to answer these questions. I will get too emotional, uh, you know, I'll choke so why don't so what do you think I, i'm not a human being with, with <laughs> emotions <laughs> it was just let me uh, let me say this that it was really hard i can tell you about that uh, food lines it's not a really good story um, so like uh, gabriel uh, was saying there was there's a jazz musician in our uh, you know uh, neighborhood and he was looking at our pictures uh, and some of the pictures are abstract and he said oh i want to uh, collaborate with you on our music. So I'm not going to tell you uh, about that. I'm not going to bore you about that, which is coming out as an excellent project. But he is the one who said, you know, right in our near our apartment building, there is on certain Wednesdays, there is a huge food line for food pantry. Can you come and take pictures, you know, and I never use camera for a very different reason. I never use camera. And it was so painful to watch all these people. It went three blocks around the line. And how do you take picture of that? You know, how do you tell people I'm documenting your story? Because in a way, they don't want that to be documented. They don't want to be uh, their faces to be seen. So I made sure that I don't I tried my best not to take pictures from the front, just the line. So going back to Marisol, it, everything was there. I mean, we had at some point, we had to tell ourselves, we cannot do this anymore. And we had to stop. That's it. We cannot. So uh, it was hard. It was really hard. Uh, tied to that, Praveen, uh, Dean Richard says, thank you for a powerful presentation. The photos uh, feel so raw and carry such impact. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dean. Uh, there's another question for you, and it says, in, in what ways do you think New York City's experience during the pandemic differed from the rest of the country and the world? See, I have, I have seen 2008, 2009. I, I have to be very uh, ruthless on this. Um, I have also seen post 9-11 New York City. It's like every time we have a crisis, the entire world sits like a vulture and says, okay, that's it. New York City is done. And while you are saying New York City is done, give and take five, six years, magic happens. So every time magic happens, people will tell you, okay, wait, you know, we'll see that magic. You see, so that I just cannot really possibly imagine why people look at it like this. Even now, if you remember in the month of October, November, there are people, there are artists who actually were focusing how New York City is going to be abandoned. And they were focusing on these empty streets. Of course, if you, if you have been on these streets in normal time, they were very crowded, but that's not the real story. You see, uh, uh, so I just don't like that. I honestly don't like that. And I can tell you, give and take one year, and these people talk to these people. You know, I don't know how many of you have been to the new Penn Station. It looks beautiful. And those of you who have not been to the new Penn Station, you will be shocked that even in this pandemic, how I, I saw it on the 7th Avenue, I saw it on the 5th Avenue, the MTA workers doing their job you know so you will see the magic you see uh, so i don't know it never stops and that's what really annoys me that how the entire world sits like a vulture that now you're doomed now you're doomed and actually it never happens alex nagel says to you uh 
thank you, thanks you all, uh, Praveen, Susina, and Massimo. And he also says that living in Chelsea, there was a sign on one theater that said, keep on dancing, which he shared with his family and friends in Europe. I, I you know, I can, I can I have two minutes to say something? Yes. So it was also very emotional. And this is, uh, these are the time when you think that sometimes you should do things, little things in your life, you know? So, because Alex uh, talked about Chelsea. So we had a colleague uh, uh, and he used to live in Chelsea. And every time, at least once in two months, he will see me on the corner of 23rd and 8th Avenue and he will talk to me. And every time I thought maybe he wants to have coffee you know, with me. And maybe sometime I should ask him uh, that, uh, you know, do you want to have lunch? Do you want to have coffee? And of course, we all have busy lives. So we I never took that initiative. That was the first death in our department. He died. How do I like like that student who left New York City, not because of pandemic, but because of ra racism? How do I now deal with that emotion that how come I did not take that initiative? of asking this amazing guy who is to stop me because he lived in that neighborhood and I never took that initiative. How do I live with that guilt? So at many levels, and I'm sure, you know, uh, my dean who is here knows exactly whom I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, these are very hard emotional questions about our own behavior, about our own uh, way of thinking about things. Thanks. Uh, there are several more comments just saying how extremely emotional uh, the pictures are and, and, the, and how emotional it made, made other people feel. I'd like to ask Austin if she has anything that she'd like to add before closing up. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Hope I did okay with the slides. I, it's just such, I, I saw one comment that said, you know, this is a great seminar. I hope that other people get a chance to watch it. We did record it, so it will be available. We do plan to use the content on our website, maybe in an exhibition to have all the talks. So I'm just so grateful to Praveen and Susina that they took these pictures and recorded what we were all feeling. Thank you. And thank you, Lo Song, who's been managing the room. Just so appreciate it. We do have a talk coming up, um, but you know, I don't want to stop people from making um, and other comments or questions for Sustainability Week, we'll have um, Colleen Hill and Mimi Prober give a talk about fashion and sustainability. So we are continuing to dance, as Praveen mentioned. And Alex Nagel, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming for this uh, talk and exhibition. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, and Massimo, you did a great job. Yeah. Thank you, Massimo. Oh, awesome. great. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Excellent work. Thank you, Massimo.